I think we might get started tonight. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional custodians on the land on which we meet. I pay my respects to those elders who have cared and to continue to care for country. Sovereignty never ceded. So welcome. I'm Anne Stephen, a Senior Curator of Art at the Chachak Wing Museum here. Back in 2018, or 17 it might have been, Dan, I approached um, the artist to develop a new work for this new museum before it was even built. Um, he just completed uh, a major portrait of Charles Perkins for the university's Charles Perkins Health Centre. Tonight, I'm delighted to welcome the artist and three other guests who will each speak on his wonderful immersive installation, Pediment in Pediment, that inaugurates the first contemporary art project in our Penelope Gallery. After our guests have each spoken, I'll ask them some questions and we aim to finish around 7.30. So we hope you might join us on the terrace for more informal conversations. The first speaker is the artist Daniel Boyd, who's been exhibiting his work nationally and internationally since 2005, notably he was in the 56th Venice Biennale, All the World's Futures, curated by Okwe Enweza in 2015. And in 2020, uh, Dan completed the Aboriginal War Memorial in Canberra. Daniel's identification with the Kuchla Gangalu peoples has come to inform his work which considers Eurocentric perspectives on the history and ethics of colonisation. He also has Pacific Islander heritage and his work traces this cultural ancestry in relation to the broader histories of Western art, like his major painting down in the Coastline exhibition on level one. He will speak about the ideas that prompted his approach to museum collections. Thanks, Dan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, Okay, so I guess I guess I'll start with my my kind of like visual language, and it'll help you to understand how the objects exist in the in the context of the museum. So uh, the surfaces of the paintings, for example, the one that you're look, looking at, or the uh, the tables in Impediment, impediment. Each each dot is meant to represent a lens, so it becomes about perception, and the the lenses um, are created within this 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 uh, this black space, um, and and the space is is there to make you. Um, it, it's made visible to make you aware of the fact that there are multiple points of perception when it comes to engaging with something. So you have uh, the uh, the Acropolis, um, or a model, a plaster model of the Acropolis in Athens. And um, What I what I try to do uh, with the the language is to make people acknowledge that space between these lenses. So um, so it becomes about your relationship to the other, and 
that being the process of making something come to be uh, a collective understanding of something, a pluralism, a, a plurality, or, or, or a multiplicity, a way, a, a way of engaging with uh, an idea through different entry points and different exit points. So these, uh, uh, this language um, is about acknowledging that you can't have something without the other. And, um, and that kind of, if that makes sense, it kind of brings me to the, to the collection at the museum. Uh, so I was, uh, I was asked by, by the museum to uh, engage with, with their collection to present something in the Penelope Gallery here in the Chow Chak Wing Museum. And during that period of research, I'd come across many, many things. And they were all very, very interesting. We, we started with objects that related to particular places that I have a relationship to. But I felt it was, I kind of felt it was more important that I, I use objects that related to most people. And uh, whether they realize it or not, they're constantly engaging with um, classicism and neoclassicism every day. They walk around a built environment. So the model of the Acropolis made sense for me to start conversations around what it means to be a First Nations person in Australia and to be constantly reminded of the process of colonization and the relationship to the Enlightenment um, and classicism. Uh, I'd, I'd already been kind of looking at these, these things in 2000 and 11, I was asked to uh, take up a artist in residency at the Natural History Museum in London. And that was kind of like my first uh, entry into ideas that relate to the Enlightenment. I wanted to try and understand museums and how they came to be uh, and try to work out how, as a black person from here, how that how that also can be a part of these things that are held within mu these museums. So I, I um, I'd previously looked at the kind of legacy of colonization through other, um, other means, other ideas, uh, but the, the museum prompted me to think more broadly about the Enlightenment and how that affected uh, my people here. And so it was um, trying to go back to the beginning to understand museums and collections. So I, I'd, I'd been thinking about this process since that time and when this opportunity came up I, I kind of felt that that you know using these these objects that relate to classicism and neoclassicism they kind of felt like they were the they, they were the most important um, or they were the for me the easiest way of engaging with this particular legacy so um, So the, the 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 tables in the in the exhibition, for me for me they kind of I, I guess um, if you can kind of if you can kind of picture the that that threshold so like the threshold uh, as being uh, like the surface of the ocean or. Um, in the way that it's it's never 
it's never static. You know, you kind of activate it when you go down to this to the space. You can um, you see the reflection in the in the mirrored dots. And as the viewer, you you change your your point of view and how you how you relate to the, the objects on the tables. So, as you move around the space, you as the viewer kind of activate it, and it and it's in the space and the light kind of shimmers. That's the kind of um, uh, the you know that that same process of the the kind of like. Uh, something like the surface of the ocean never being static. You know, these objects, they exist in time and space. And in the future, they're going to continue to accumulate associations. It's just about making people aware of this, um, these, these objects and how they have all these different uh, points of entry or how they have associations through time and space and how they never just an, an object, um, you know, they, things are complex, we are complex. And um, it was about extending um, or augmenting these associations or making people aware of their kind of um, those associations. So that's why I, I, I kind of felt like you know these were were key in, in starting that conversation. Um, I, I I don't know. Uh, uh, maybe maybe I shouldn't talk for so long. Um, uh, but that that kind of gives you a, a general idea of how I came to to choose these particular objects and how how I relate to to classicism and and the museum context. But I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna pass over to to Peter, and he's gonna give you a little bit more information about the objects, um, and a little bit more about the history of the objects. So, it's Peter. Thanks, Dan. Just to briefly introduce Peter Wilson, um, who is going to talk, as Anne said, about the former life of the objects, to which um, the Carson Daniels work refer. Um, Peter is the William Ritchie Professor of Classics here at the University of Sydney, where he was also an undergraduate back in the 1980s. Uh, he teaches ancient Greece literature and his research is primarily on ancient Greek theatre as a social, economic and political institution. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Anne. And may I say just how truly, truly honoured I am to have been invited um, to be part of this panel. Um, as Anne said, I spend most of my time studying ancient Greek language and literature and teaching it and researching uh, the mainly the texts of ancient Greece, a little bit the material culture. But my broader academic field of classics is engaged at the moment in worldwide in a kind of reckoning with its own past, uh, and its entanglement in systems of power, in colonialism, and in the project of empire, and the various uses and misuses to which ideas of the classical past have been put. And in preparing for this evening, I was struck by how the objects in Daniel Boyd's beautiful um, exhibition work have in one way not that much to do with what I primarily spend my time looking at, texts and objects from ancient Greece, but a great deal to do with the way in which antiquity was invoked by the British Empire. But they are also objects that I, we as classicists, cannot disown or claim no responsibility for. So for me, it's been a really, really welcome opportunity to reflect on that fact and on those issues being a classist here in this part of the world. So I, I thank you for, for that uh, prompt. So I'll just say, if I can, a few things about the objects in two senses. One, um, what you might call their former life in, as objects in the ancient world, or the things to which the casts in particular refer. And then a little bit about what I call the sort of pathos of plaster in the, in the 19th century. And in, in the ancient contexts, the five big 
bits of sculptural um, uh, solid pieces that form the, the lateral wings and the centerpiece of, the, of Daniel Boyd's work were from sacred spaces. They were all from sanctuaries. They were all from part of the architecture of large temple buildings. And they all came from much, much bigger friezes, continuous carved uh, uh, imagery placed strategically on a building. So these are tiny fragments of much bigger things. The Parthenon frieze alone was 160 meters long, and we have this one little cast of one piece of it. They also came from three very different places in the Greek world, um, and they span in their own life uh, over uh, one and a half centuries. So they're, they're, they're different and multiple in their, in their own origins. And the imagery on them participated in much bigger stories that were widely shared uh, within Greek culture across all of Greece, and um, they're major narratives that were very meaningful to the religion of the ancient Greeks. As it happens, on each of the three buildings from which these friezes came, the frieze sat in a different place. And there are a lot of interesting questions as to how legible they were to ancient viewers on their original buildings. Uh, and in the context of very different lighting conditions, some were in a deep gloom, others were on the outside of buildings at a jagged angle that would be really difficult to see from, from the ground. So on the left-hand side, as you enter um, the gallery, those ones come from a temple that was in a remote valley in Arcadia in southern Greece, um, the temple of Apollo at a place called Bassae. Apollo there was called Epikurios, the healer, the helper. I'm not entirely sure why. There are different ideas about that. And, and those are the youngest of all. They're from 400 BC. And they're basically naked Greek heroic men uh, attacking dressed Amazons. The centerpiece at the, at the back of the room is from Athens. It's one from the Parthenon frieze. Um, the Temple of Athena, the Maiden, the Parthenon, and that's the charioteer with its four horses. On the right, is the right-hand side of the room, um, these all come from Delphi. And Delphi was probably the single most sacred place in Greece. It was called by the Greeks the navel of the earth. And it was a place of pilgrimage for all Greeks and for non-Greeks. We know Egyptians went there, and the king of Lydia himself, Croesus, went there to speak to Apollo to try and get some directions for his future, which he, he badly misunderstood. That was a small building. It was six meters by eight and a half uh, meters <clears throat> on its floor plan. It was built by citizens of a small island in the middle of the Aegean called Siphnos. <clears throat> the Greeks called it a Thessauros, which means a treasure house. And it was not quite a temple. It was somewhere between a temple and an investment bank uh, because the Siphnians had, had a huge strike of silver and gold on their island, and they made the possibly wise decision to give a tenth of it to the god. And they built, probably spent almost all of it, building this exquisite little temple made of Parian marble with all the sculpture around it. And the sculpture around it was a gigantomachy. It was basically Olympian gods fighting off the primeval pre-Olympian gods or the giants for control of the cosmos. So a pilgrim approaching this building would have on her left-hand side, going up the steep hill from Delphi Harbor up to the top of the mountain, they would sort of join in, be conscripted into this battle, because if you see the, the gods of the Olympus are moving from left to right, and the giants are trying to push them back down the hill. <clears throat> but as I say, perhaps um, the real point of reference for uh, these objects isn't Arcadia or Delphi or Athens, but Imperial London. And they're here in Sydney, the casts and the miniature of the Acropolis, because in the late 19th and early 20th century, casts and models became extremely popular as teaching tools uh, to teach various aspects of the classical past in universities, <coughs> museums, and art schools. They're better than photographs because of their three-dimensionality, and they had the added benefit of being exact scale, one-to-one -one with the original. And there was a new impulse in teaching classics at this time to look beyond pretty much what I look at, the text and the words, to the material remains of antiquity. And in an article written in 1916, an American classicist um, advocates this new view. He says, many advantages can be gained for the higher Hellenic humanism and classical culture by a contemplation of casts of the noblest treasure of Greek art, the Panathenaic procession of the still unexcelled Parthenon. And he goes on to advise teachers that when originals are not accessible, then recourse may be had to casts. And he even usefully gives an address in Unter den Linden, Berlin, 76A, where you can buy a, your own version of the Valga Acropolis for 
150 American dollars. And in Sydney, it was a particular individual, um, a professor and the curator of the Nicholson Museum from <coughs> about 1903 to 1936, William Woodhouse, who's the primary figure responsible for gathering all these casts here in Sydney. And they, he was said to have a passion for casts, which must be true because by 1930, he got over 400 of them in the museum. It seems to me that in Australia, plaster cast signified a desire for attachment to what was seen as this ultimate source of cultural prestige and for a connection to the power relations with that prestige that the British Empire had managed to construct. So these objects became strange emissaries, emissaries of that power in the, in the realest of ways, not least because that connection and that attachment wasn't just symbolic, but was also real and material. As you think about the process of making a cast, I think it's important that when an initial cast is made, plaster used to make the mold in which the cast was made was applied directly to the surface of the ancient monument. And I'm guessing that there was something magical or talismanic about that idea that this cast had had direct contact with this original and plays some sort of subterranean role in explaining the lure of casts. But it also, to me, at least signifies a certain kind of pathos, a sim that something fragile and pathetic about this yearning in this distant southern hemisphere for that kind of contact and that kind of attachment that accentuates rather than removes a sense of dislocation and distance. And that pathos is highlighted by the fabric of plaster itself, which is lowly regarded, it's cheap, it's friable and breaks easily. But the cast promised authenticity, it, but at the same time, it misrepresents reality in interesting ways, even to the extent of damaging it. It misrepresents reality in that it completely decontextualizes these items from antiquity. They're completely, obviously, removed from every other context, from their sculptural context, architectural context, their religious context, what they meant to the ancients. But then there's the question of color because a plaster cast produces a much whiter object than the original. So it radically misrepresents how Greek sculpture actually looked. And as we now know, of course, ancient Greek sculpture was generally polychromatic. It was painted, uh, often painted in very bright and entirely unnaturalistic colors. But the question of the whiteness of Greek sculpture loomed large, loomed enormously over the history of art and beyond in the 19th and 20th century, the 18th century. The most famous proponent of the idea that ancient Greek art, ancient Greek sculpture was completely white was, of course, the German Johann Winckelmann, often regarded as one of the founders of art history itself as a discipline. And to him, the whiteness of Greek sculpture was absolutely central both to his theory and to his history of art. Well, plaster casts had the strange effect of encouraging and helping to promote the completely false view that ancient Greek sculpture was stark white. And when they came to the British Museum in the 19th century, early in the 19th century, the Parthenon marbles were actually ochre-tinted, honey-colored, and in some cases, deep brown. And this presented an enormous shock to the sensibilities um, based on the prevailing theories of art of the time that insisted ancient marble had to be white. And this is where we see that not only does the cast misrepresent reality, it plays a role in changing it and even deforming it. Because a not notorious consequence of this response to the marbles was a program of abrasive cleaning, supposedly to protect them, which in fact removed the remains of the original polychromy. And as late as the 1930s, a process of ruthless whitening took place in the British Museum during a period when it was under the malign influence of the millionaire art dealer, Lord Joseph Devine, who'd undertaken to finance the gallery in which, of course, the Parthenon marbles still sit. The whole thing was covered up by the British Museum to the extent of actually getting some uh, workmen to put brown color back on the marbles that had been scoured with metal brushes and actually chisels. The chisels actually managed to remove some of the finer um, sculptural work on the surfaces too. So there's a strange sense in which the, the copies were in the end preferable in some sense to the originals. There's one further irony that that is that the process of making the plaster casts themselves also helped remove the last evidence of color on them. In 1836, one of the trustees of the British Museum expressed his alarm that every time there was a request for new molds to be made of the cast because they wore down and got lose their detail, 
last traces of color were being taken away. And it turned out that the acid wash, which was used to get the, the lye soap that was put on the, the, the ancient marbles before the plaster was applied, was, of course, removing uh, the paint. So I'll just say one last thing about, I think, the, the model. I talked about the, the cast and the sculptures. The model um, of the Acropolis was commissioned in America, designed and made in Germany, and then sent all around the world, basically, including here. In 1891, the Met in New York commissioned Heinrich Walger, a German sculptor living in Berlin, to create an accurate model of the Acropolis. And it's worth pointing out that Walger's model represents the Acropolis in a very particular way. It's an Acropolis which, again, is stripped and almost scraped right back down to what remained of its classical brief 5th century phase. So more than 2,000 years of the accretions of life and other cultures had been removed. The Parthenon itself had been a Christian cathedral for a thousand years and a mosque for 400 years after that. But in Valga's case, he was actually representing what was there because um, the architects and archaeologists of Germany and Greece had actually stripped the Parthenon, the whole Acropolis stone, back to that level. And one of the things that strikes me about the, the relationship between the scales here is that you've got in, in the juxtaposition of the one-to-one -one and the one to 425 scale, this sort of micro Acropolis in Daniel Boyd's work, a really powerful interaction between scales. And the micro Acropolis sits there among the casts and it prompted at me at least the question of just how big really are these objects of classical Greece and Rome and, and antiquity when we look at them from here, which is a, a worthwhile question for me to be asked to ask. So thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. Uh, our next speaker is Erin Vink, a Nyingpa woman, an assistant curator of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Previously, she was the inaugural Indigenous assistant curator of art at the Australian War Memorial. Her recent curatorial projects include the current National 2021, uh, Longing for Home, also this year, and Warura Kanyini from last year, 2020, and Daniel Boyd's For Our Country, 2019, co-curated with Tony Bailey, which address Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's experience of country and relation um, inherent in the desire to defend it. Erin is an alumni member of the prestigious National Gallery of Australia's Indigenous Arts Leadership Program supported by West Farmers Arts. Could you welcome her? Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that we're on Aboriginal land and pay my respects to other First Nations people in the room. I thought I would, um, instead of talking at you about Dan's work, um, talk about how I perceive it as a First Nations uh, curator uh, working and practicing uh, here in Australia. I think uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people we're inherently political people and I think this is something that always comes out in uh, First Nations artists work whether they they like it or not. Myself as an institutional curator um, I prefer not to use that term really. I think of myself as a cultural keeper and uh, while I have interest in, uh, you know, the history of Western art and, you know, these pieces that we're seeing today, I think there's a much richer, uh, you know, ancient knowledge um, of art which should be taught and talked about in this country and I think it's a real shame that, uh, you know, these cultural knowledges have been left at the wayside um, over the, the course of our history because of empire and because of the Enlightenment. While I was uh, researching for this talk, I thought uh, it was interesting to find that the very first museum was established in the third century. But it wasn't until uh, actually 1500s uh, when the term museum kind of came into being. And that was a term that was used to describe the art and object collection of the Medicis. And then the Enlightenment happened and this kind of quasi-scientific uh, model of the museum kind of came out and started categorising our people. 
And I think Dan as an artist and myself as a, a curator, um, I think it's a shame to see that cultural objects really um, have been categorised under an ethnographic sense in the establishment of the museum. And if we look back to the, you know, that original root of that word of museum, it was art and objects. And so maybe that's the direction museums need to go into today. Uh, one thing I think Dan is really skilled at is highlighting um, different perspectives. So I know he talked to you about uh, those lenses that you're seeing on these paintings and the lenses that kind of um, project a veil onto the, the plaster casts um, that we've just heard about. But what I find most interesting about the work is that blackness and that there's these knowledges uh, that we aren't aware of or aren't privy to. And these are really important knowledges that, uh, you know, everyone brings different perspectives to what they're looking at. And Dan, as a First Nations artist and myself, we can bring, uh, you know, ancient 65,000-year-old Indigenous knowledges into these conversations. And I think that's a really important thing. Uh, obviously, it's a nod to the Elgin marbles and, you know, the controversy around the return of cultural material. And so I think that's one idea that's really important to this work. Um, at the beginning of 2020, I put a Freedom of Information Act request into the British Museum to see how many um, First Nations remains have been uh, requested by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and those who have been returned. And at the time when I got my reply back, there was only two requests made, um, one in 2005 by Torres Strait Islander people and their cultural uh, remains were returned. And the second was a request from the Jaburung people um, of the Kulin Nation in, uh, Na around Nam or Melbourne. And that request was denied. So I think, you know, going to talk about the amount of cultural uh, material, let alone our ancestors in these, you know, big machines, these big colonial kind of institutions, uh, isn't that absolutely a horrifying figure to think of that our people are in boxes in these museums? I think that's something Dan has talked about. Um, he had his uh, commission uh, with the Natural History Museum and, you know, played to some of those ideas and um, so it's all part of a kind of bigger picture that we can engage in. If these marb marbles are let go, you know, does that mean that all of our ancestors have to come back? So I think it's a really interesting conversation and I know Dan mentioned talking about objects and, you know, like the lives that are imprinted on them as they kind of move through history. So looking at that blackness again, when we're looking at those marbles or one of Dan's paintings, we can think about... I would look at those marbles and think of these ideas, but do you? And if you don't, maybe should you? The other thing I thought um, is a kind of big idea that comes out in this work is uh, the lack of Indigenous knowledges. And I think this is something that we're really aware of at the moment um, that has definitely been heightened because of 2020 and the Black Lives Matter campaign and everything we saw about monuments um, things being pulled down and museums like this one we're in now, also, you know, my art museum that I work in, uh, all of these big uh, institutions are being forced to kind of reckon with their colonial pasts and they have to either position themselves as an agent of change and, you know, acknowledge their, their histories and try to decolon decolonise themselves or indigenise themselves or they'll be left behind and they'll only be relevant to people who stay in that colonial state of mind. So for me, when I'm looking at Dan's work within that blackness, I think about the indigenous knowledges that belong to the place that we're in. Um, as you heard, I'm a Nyempa person, so uh, we reside around the area of Bawarana. And at that place, we have the world's oldest man-made structure, the fish traps. And, you know, this is a... a a significant uh, piece of world history that not a lot of people know about. Like, Australians certainly do, I hope they would, 
but you know this is a like a world wonder that isn't known outside of Australia really um, so how can we go about changing some of these things so all part of a bigger picture I don't want to talk too long because we're going to have some good chat so I might pass it over to Michael Thanks, Erin. Our last speaker is Michael Mosman, uh, who's a Kuku Kuku Yalanji man, born and raised in Cairns on Yidinji country. He now lives and works on Gadigal land and is a lecturer and researcher at the University of Sydney School of Architectural Design and Planning, where he's just been awarded his Doctor of Philosophy um, with the topic of his thesis, Third Space, Architecture and Indigeneity. Congratulations. He's also a registered architect who champions country and First Nations cultures as agents for structural change in the broader architectural profession at educational practice and policy levels. Please welcome him. Looks like I drew the short straw and got last place, eh? Um, so I'd like to just say hello. I'm a Kuku Yelanji man. My name is Michael and I'm an Aboriginal man. And I'm also a colonised man. I'm trained in a profession, architecture, which has a legacy of actions that has colonised and continues to colonise this continent and, is, and our ways. I proudly live and work on Gadigal country, the inner west. They both coexist. I met my partner here and my kids are born on Gadigal country. So I walk in two worlds where, on the one hand, my ancestry connects me to territory prior to contact with the white man. And on the other, as a lecturer and researcher here at the University of Sydney, School of Architecture, Design and Planning. More specifically, I inhabit all voids between both resisting and embracing each binary condition, and yet constantly interacting with and reconciling the interstitial zones in both time and space. So I'm presenting my yarn through the lens of someone who's trained in architecture. And yes, I've just finished a PhD. And it was a four year journey that explored the interaction of country and colonialism as factors that exist in all our ways, with of course architecture being a key contributor. So what I learned you know, to, in, a, in a short way was that Western civilizing ways are built on the dogma of colonialism, cultural hegemony, and the oppression of the other, of country, to deterritorialize and territorialize in the name of the sovereign, the crown. And that this stems from Enlightenment foundations that were itself born out of resistance towards the dogmas of religion and monarchies and its ways the unrestrained impulsive actions to create rules and definitions over territory and then impose and enforce upon cultures of difference with their own ways would be comical in a satirical sense if not for the destruction of ways that resulted from such genocidal exploits. So the Enlightenment scholars looked at the true art of Greek antiquity to formulate expression which would ultimately occupy space on places such as here, on country. And for me, Dan's exhibition, and the con its commentary on the classical style, it connects me to my hometown, Cairns, Gimoy, that's Yudinji country. Cairns is a colonial outpost. And there's one built example that resonates for me that expresses the classical style. It's called the Cairns Post building and it was designed in 1908 by Harvey Draper and when I was young it was like 
such an imposing structure, and it still is to this day. And its expression is similar to the State Library, the Art Gallery, and the Australian Museum here in Sydney. So these are our imposing institutions from an architectural standpoint that have colonized country and of course are the repositories for culture with artifacts stolen from country for display for the enlightened society. Sort of like the British Museum with the acquired or stolen marbles. So these places are representative of the veil that's draped over all of us, over all our beings and constantly taking away or stealing our current and future ways, casting shadows over the way that we interact with these places, with country. Penetrating the veil and making sense of what lies within the shadows requires actions from all of us to create concepts from what we can see through these, through these lenses to reframe current understandings into new ones. Now, bearing all this in mind, I am optimistic for the future. And in my thesis, I ultimately arrived at a position that country is always giving. And we are always, mainly, we're always taking through non-reciprocal means. So the ancient Greeks, they designed for place. They celebrated its spirit much like First Nations cultures on this continent. We are part of place. We're all part of country. The new classical style took the ancient Greek idea and homogenized it as a fundamental colonizing device that we all see around us. It's now time for all of us to give back to country, to look through the veil, to feel it, to smell it, listen to it, taste it, to interact with those fleeting moments in order to reciprocally engage with all of it, how we relate to all of it and how we translate those relations and ultimately how we transform our interactions as part of country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I'm going to ask each of you a question or two, uh, starting with Dan. Um, and blackness or darkness has been touched on by all of you. But I just wondered whether you would talk a little bit about blackness, opacity. I mean, obviously, many artists from Malevich to Ed Reinhardt, well, Hoteri have used blackness, but you, in uh, the process of developing the installation, um, handed me a book of Edouard Glisson, and it was uh, that from there that the quote on the wall came. So I wondered if you could uh, elaborate on how Glissant's ideas inform yours in terms of opacity. Well, I, well, I, I guess um, Glissant, Glissant's philosophies play play a part of um, like the the language that I share m my ideas through. Mm. And um, Glissant, Edouard Glissant, uh, has a theory about opacity, and um, uh, so basically, it's it's one's right to difference. It's, it's not allowing someone to project onto you. So, uh, so it's kind of in in opposition to the British and imperialism and colonization. So then they're, they're not. It's not like Captain Cook um, looking at the land and deciding that there's nothing there. Um, 
So, yeah, so Gusson holds that idea that having that right to opacity mm -hmm. as being a, a better way of starting a relationship to the other, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. not, um, not, not being able to uh, take your, your knowledge and understanding of things and then see that person in your image. It, it, mm. it's not it's not about seeing someone else in your image it's about um uh a equal a mm. equal engagement mm. um i i also I, I think uh an another way to think about the the dark space is um uh, as a void but you're kind of acknowledging that void as being a part of the experience between lenses. So it's like um, Glissant spoke about the, uh, the experience of the, so he says it's the experience of the abyss it exists inside and outside of the abyss. You, can, you, can't, you can't have one without the other. And I kind of feel that this language, this visual language that I've created is, is, um, is about that. Mm. It's about everything. Um, you could use uh, dark matter uh, to um, uh, speak about that same process. It's uh, w what, what we, it's about acknowledging that we can't fully comprehend like the, the expansion of the universe and like our relationship to the birth of the universe and where we're going, we 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 don't we don't know that like we have no understanding of what that is. It's it's about trying to um, take these objects and things mm -hmm. and 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 create them in a. Uh, cr create a scenario where their trajectory or their, their relationship to time and space can be um, associated with all of those interactions with mm. them. Um, keeping them open to mm. that mm. process. So it's, it's um, yeah, that, and, and, and also it, it's about this, you know, you say a, a viewer comes to the work, um, <coughs> When they look at these, uh, the the um, the lenses and and the space between, they usually come to it and say, "Oh, there's all this information within the lenses, and then there's nothing in between it." It's kind of like an oxymoron. It's actually black, and um, they're kind of acknowledging that it's there without saying that it's there, and I think that's. Uh, that's um, that's also important mm. to the work. Mm. Thank you, um, Peter. Um, you spoke about the former life of the casts. I just wondered whether I could press you a little bit about how you see Dan's work reshaping or shaping their afterlife. Well, um. Um, is this can you work it? <laughs> speak a little bit? Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I get. Look, that's a, that's a wonderful question, and it's really it's for me. Um, it was the point that I was trying to say at the beginning about how mm. being asked to think about this and to to address the work and to address the roots, the distant roots of classic classical culture in them and the history of classical tradition. Or whatever you want to call it beyond that, has, has made me realize um, that um, the work has, for me, made this extraordinary kind of transformation of my viewing of these objects that I'm so familiar with. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's, it might sound like a, a, a slightly uh, uh, well, embarrassing thing to say in a way. It sort of should be a slightly embarrassing thing to say because these things are, you know, I'm, and I didn't grow up studying classics in a sort of, familiar way, it was a kind of, I came to it in a kind of odd way myself, but the fact that I live here in this country 
and I've worked here for a long period of my, uh, my life and professionally studied classics in this way. And um, to have them sort of defamiliarized so powerfully and beautifully uh, for me was very moving. So I guess I'm answering on a sort of more personal level, uh, but I think that can pretty easily be extrapolated into um, what I was saying at the, my initial remarks. That's to say that my profession, such as it is of classical studies, but also the broader humanities, uh, you know, are really going through a phase now of um, decolonizing their understanding of what they do and how they do it and what they've done. Uh, and um, I think that here in Australia, that has not really, it's taken root much more in the US and in the UK, in, in uh, my areas and related areas, but I think it's, um, you know, in, a, in some way, that's, uh, there's, a, there's a more of a, of a prompt to be, to be mm. uh, undertaking that work here now mm. as a result. Thank you. Uh, Michael, uh, Dan started off uh, his career as a painter, and yet in recent times he's moved far more into three-dimensional space. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine, their child, their favourite room is Dan's, in the favourite room in the museum is Dan's, and she calls it her mirror house. <laughs> Um, I mean, in a sense, the very title, Pediment Impediment, is taken from architecture. I just wondered whether you would talk a little bit about um, how his work uses, how it transforms the three-dimensional space. Well, I, th I think and it's about... In an Indigenous way. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's about, um, you know, architecture is, you know, we're sort of like a generation behind where the art world is, you know, for First Nations in a First Nations context. And we've learned, as architects, we've learned heaps from the messages and, you know, all the empowerment that has come out of the art world. And for Dan to now sort of move into this um, other space, into this architectural built environment space, you know, just it just highlights, um, and he brings this political, you know, these politically charged statements as well, and it's something that we always strive to do, like Aaron's saying, it's part, it's inherently part of us. We can't help but be political, and no doubt with Dan's contributions in, in the built environment that, you know, it does um, present a whole new audience out there to see how, you know, how the built environment is sort of projected up upon us all. So this notion of, um, you know, being able to see yourself in these reflections, for instance, like at the MCA in, on the staircase, you know, mm. it's all about movement and you know, how you perceive yourself within these small, you know, mirror lenses. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting device to use. Mm -hmm. And it's something that we can all take away and, you know, it's, it's, it's fresh eyes that come into play that, you know, we can all be influenced by it and no doubt he's, you know, seeing other, um, you know, players in the architecture world and being influenced by that. So... Mm. Yeah, I think there's a, um, an amazing sort of, you know, fresh quality that he contributes to this space. Mm. Thanks, Michael. Um, finally, Erin, um, you spoke about the installation connecting to ideas of repatriation. I just wondered whether you'd extend your thoughts to those really big questions about decolonising museums. Okay. Mm. Um, <laughs> that's a very loaded question. Um, I think to even start that conversation, it, as a First Nations person, it depends if you perceive the world as being in a post-colonial space. 
Um, for many of us, we are still in a colonised space. We mm. haven't moved into uh, the postmodern. And so we can't decolonise if we're still currently being colonised. So there's um, wonderful curators and academics out there, um, St Stephen Gilchrist even, um, here at the university, who talks about um, while decolonisation is the goal, perhaps indigenisation is the better strategy. And when we're in spaces like this, particularly this being a brand new building, and myself at the art gallery, we're cu currently building Sydney Modern. So these brand new spaces, how can you um, decolonise them? Um, and I don't think you can. I think it's physically impossible. Um, so I think it's more about... Um, cultural keepers or curators like myself uh, working with our artists who can answer these big heavy questions to to make um, safe spaces that um, where we um, they're sovereign spaces for us um, you know our culture and our language exists there um, we don't have to fight to hold space within the rest of the institution um, and I think that's the only way mm. we can do that. Mm. Thank you very much. Um, look, on that very uh, strong note, I'd like to, if all the audience could join me in thanking the speakers, thanking Dan and my fellow panellists 